say the food has been incredible so far. Come on up, friends. We are so excited to have you guys. Like she said, thank you for pivoting. We were very scared about Tuesday. And I know I wouldn't have come out, so we didn't want y'all to come out. So thank you for being here. Um, a big round of applause for my banquet team, my chef, my sales team. And thank you all for being so gracious. My whole team is like, they're so nice. They're so complimentary. I'm like, they're in our industry. They understand it's next. So thank you all for being here. Um, we appreciate you. If you need anything or would like tours at some point, email me, let me know. Thank you, Monica. My name is Avery Bobbitt, and I'm your 2024 Director of Programs. And I have, thank you, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight, Brittany Branson. A born and raised Jersey girl, Brittany Branson is a Destination Live winning artist and coach for creatives based in greater Washington, D.C. area. Since 2015, she has helped hundreds of couples and clients all over the U.S. and world create lasting impressions of love, of their love by turning their most memorable moments into meaningful masterpieces. Brittany has been proudly interviewed by or featured in Brides, Martha Stewart Wedding, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and many other publications. Having lived a past life in arts administration and legislation, Brittany is passionate about blending her knowledge of creative strategy and arts entrepreneurship to help fellow creatives better their businesses and bottom lines. She is currently a candidate for a master's in arts management at George Mason University. Though, her, though people are her passion, dogs are her delight. Brittany donates a portion of the proceeds from every service to the local animal rescue from which she and her husband adopted their two dogs, Bolt and Ginger. Welcome, Brittany. But the NEA 
NEA is the National Endowment for the Arts, and the NEH is the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I particularly loved interning with the NEH because I was in their White House and Congressional Affairs Division. Now, I had been there for a few months, working directly with their congressionally appointed director. Everything was going swimmingly until one lovely morning in October of 2013. Now, I know this is a little bit of a while ago, but for those who may remember, October, November, December of 2013 in the federal government was a little whack. A little bit of a whack a time. <laughs> and so for us that morning, I go into work on a lovely fall day, and we walked straight into a bit of a PR crisis. Now, I am not here to name names. That's just not the person I'm going to be tonight. But the reason it was a PR crisis was because one particular very high-ranking senator, who's no longer in office, but at the time very high-ranking, very notable, decided to release, rather randomly, his list of the top 10 examples of the most wasteful government spending. And you can imagine whose agency made it on the list. Not once, twice, and then along with her sister agency was also on the list. It was us at the NEH. Now, we weren't exactly shocked. We were shocked at the list. You know, it would have been a little bit of a courtesy. You know, can you give us a little bit of a heads up so we know we're playing defense for the next few weeks? Um, but we weren't exactly shocked at this mentality because how many of you out there whether it was when you were younger or even now, if you loved theater, writing, painting, whatever, how many of you had people in your life who were like, eh, you should probably go do something else. You're gonna starve. You're never gonna find a job, right? Yeah. Now, I was very lucky at the time. I grew up in New Jersey, right, not too far from Manhattan. So my family, was very cultured in that sense that I just grew up in a family who really appreciated the arts and culture. So this particular instance was like the first time in my life where not only in the professional workplace, an adult, and very much someone who was very much more of an adult than me at the time, basically told me what you do is worthless, what you do is silly, what you do is frivolous. And so I just like to tell that story because that's sort of the fire that I kind of always keep in my belly with whatever I do, whatever decision I make, because that never feels good, right? And so when it was time to leave that nine to five life behind and jump into the wedding and events industry, ooh, I was determined to never be viewed as frivolous, unnecessary, or trivial or wasteful ever again. But, okay. <laughs> We're gonna do it. I swear. Maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but how exactly was I going to do that? Because at the time, not only did I find myself wanting to become a full-time visual artist, which is its own thing, right? But the wedding and events industry. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in a second about how I'm married to an airline pilot. And you can imagine in social situations when we introduce ourselves and what we do, everyone kind of flocks to him. <laughs> People don't know what the heck to do about me. So when it was time to start my business, I was like, how do I approach business as a right-brained creative? I am very much right-brained, y'all. I mean, I can't even pack a pair of shoes correctly sometimes, I swear. How do I gain traction in an industry that doesn't even know I exist? And I mean, still to this day, I've been at this eight or nine years now. Uh, on a weekly basis, I have really amazing people coming up to me and being like, I had no idea this was a thing, which always makes me smile. But it's still happening eight, nine years later, and with a ton of really wonderful people also doing what I do. And three, which I felt was really important, how do I establish authority and not just artistry? So when I was getting started, I have to be a little bit vulnerable and admit that I looked around at the industry and I got a little jealous because for me, it felt like every other vendor category, there was some sort of blueprint in place, right? Like if you were still trying to figure out your success, it felt to me that at least there was someone who came before you, 
and laid some sort of blueprint or footprints for you to follow. But I had no one. Like, my husband and I happened to have a live painter at our wedding. She was the only one I'd ever heard of, came across her randomly. So there certainly weren't people around that I could really look up to and aspire to, and I got a little bit jealous, have to admit. But what I realized was, even though all of these amazing vendors and vendor categories had blueprints for success or mentors to look up to, sometimes that can be actually a little bit detrimental. Because when you're trying to follow in footsteps that are placed for you, Sometimes you can't exactly find your own brand of unique success, right? Do we feel that a little bit? Yeah. So I realized the jealousy I felt at the time was actually you know, it was not necessarily misplaced, but it was going to be okay. But I looked around and I realized that even though there were established professionals or established wedding and event industry categories, a lot of people were running their business in this way. Style followed by story, followed by strategy, leaving their unique variable in question. To mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right here? Thank you, <laughs> So what exactly happens when we lead our business with style, then story, then strategy? There. We're inclined to copy others because you think they're successful. Now, can I get a show of hands? Whether it's your own business or organizations you work for, how many of you know you've been copied? <laughs> Absolutely. And I always, pers I always personally really chuckle because I'm very much an experimenter. I'm that geeky, nerdy person who, like, every four to six months or so, I'll go into everything and, like, Let's try out this copy. Let's try out this new form. Let's try out this new technology. And I look around and I see a lot of other artists copying, and I'm like, well, good luck with that because that did not work. <laughs> that is being mixed really fast. So, Godspeed and good luck. But this is what happens when you're leading with style. You're going to find them, you know, these people are going to find themselves inclined to copy. Number two, you're gonna be vulnerable to market changes and lost opportunities. Now this is where I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna come back to this later with I hope is a really good example. And number three. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> You're gonna be overly dependent on just outcomes to sell to clients. Now maybe this is where my artist bias is coming in but if I depended on every painting I put out being like the best and better than the rest, eh, because the reality is not every event we do is gonna be our best or our favorite, right? But it's important to our couples and clients, it's what's critically important to them, and that's amazing. But man, if I just depended on the outcome, forget like the business success, but the internal emotional roller coaster of Oh my god, like I feel like a failure this week. It didn't beat out my other paintings from last week. It's a mess. So we want to avoid that. So to recap, that X variable when we lead with style is mediocre results, a lack of originality, and I promise it's coming. Batteries. Nope. I'm so sorry, y'all. Batteries and a race to the bottom. Because if vendor A, B, and C look the same, feel the same, act the same, offer the same, psychologically, what is the only variable that couples and clients are going to hold on to? Price, absolutely. And I don't blame them, right? Like, we all do it too, and I think especially, I always think about TikTok with uh, dupes. Like, I know for me, um, I have, I may have splurged on one good anthropology mirror, you know, those, those things. No, never again. It better not be knocked over anything. It's never happening again. But so many people are offering dupes and you realize that sometimes it's the exact same glass, it's the exact same frame, but I'm going to pay a heck of a lot less because sometimes I don't need the brand recognition. So 
how can we blame couples and clients for doing the same thing if we don't offer them, if we don't stand in ourselves and in our brand, right? So I know this next sentence is gonna say, but let's flip the script, shall we? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so what we are gonna do is we're gonna lead with strategy, followed by story, followed by style, your formula for standing out and selling out. So let's break down a simple system and formula you can use for both ideation and operations in your business. But first, let's think like an actor. And if you don't mind showing me some hands, how many of you were theater kids? Woo! Yes! <laughs> yes, okay. Oh, it makes me so happy. I feel like, okay. Wait, what? Objective level categories that you can work in, 
you can use this as a warm up, or maybe you're someplace in your business where it's just good to live in those objective categories for now. But then you're going to have tactical categories that you want to do a deeper dive audit of some sort. By Rufus Sewell. I should have really just kept him the whole, whole presentation. He's, and he's not going away. <laughs> so here's the formula we're going to be working with tonight. Strategy plus story plus style equals success. And ultimately, you're going to look at the categories, plug them into A, B, C, and you can use this for ideation or operations. Maybe. Oh, no, I promise you were. There we go. Okay. So uh, let's talk about strategy. Our A. Sorry, guys. Would it be okay if I went down there and like, physically clicked it? Would anyone mind if I got off the, the little stage? Thank you. Beyond that, I feel like we could, you know, do a little bit better. 
And then experience is a fork in the road, where on one hand, it can be literally the experience of working with you, the experience you give to your couples and clients, or in an example I'll present in a second, it's literally your experience, your past, what makes you an expert, what gives you a sense of authority. And then our sub-tactical categories are professionalism, value building, building trust, and touch points. Um, I know I need to do a much better job, it's, it's a goal of mine this year, of thinking of every little touch point I have with either a potential client or really with my clients, of there's a story to be told there, and I just think of the busyness of everything, sometimes we let certain stories and certain touch points slide, so I know I'm holding myself accountable to do a little bit better this year. And then finally, style. The thing so many lead with, but should really be a supporting character. Style reflects the distinctive features that characterize the work of a particular artist, movement, or period, a unique way of presenting themselves, but I love this for everyone, characteristic way of making decisions. It does not have to be a purely visual thing. It can be ingrained even into the psychological way in which you conduct yourself. I love that so much. And our three primary categories are creation, execution, and delivery. I'm gonna throw myself under my own loving bus in a second and show you how I've been using the formula to identify where I need to improve a little bit this year, especially in the delivery category. But until then, our sub-tactical categories are differentiation, ethical inspiration, not just copying everyone and calling it, we're inspired, consistency, dependability, return clients, offboarding, and surprise and delight. Now, I have return clients living under style. Again, it, I think it's the visual artist bias in me because if clients are returning to me, they kind of have to like my style. <laughs> you know, if they want multiple works of art by me in their home, they have to kind of love a consistency of style there. But return clients, if you, if you have a business that is not like a visually oriented outcome, can definitely live under strategy because there is definitely a strategy that goes into attra re-attracting clients, right? So here's two ways we can use the formula. A plus B plus C equals success. The first way is to conduct a self-audit, and I'll show you in a second what I've been doing with myself. So a very, very simple thing to do, and this seems like elementary school math, but I kept it that way because I still count on my fingers sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, I've got to be honest, I feel like I still am at an elementary school level when it comes to that. So as that right-brained person, I try to keep it as simple and easily digestible as possible. So what I do is if I'm using the formula to help me do something, I look at all the categories and select what if there's a common theme amongst some of them, and I score them from one to five in the hopes that the formula is going to equal 15, because that's a perfect score, right? As you can see, one thing I'm personally working on um, is my offboarding process. So as a live painter, I have something really cool, which is, yes, I deliver the really awesome experience on the event day of creating something live for my couples and clients, but then I actually get to deliver the painting back to them. And one thing that I've been really kicking myself over is I feel like that offboarding process, that delivery is, is lacking something, especially since we went through six months to a year together living in creativity and possibility, and now it's time to actually get the tangible physical thing that we were working towards together. And right now I feel like it's just So when I looked at my categories, oh, there's animation. Oh, here we go. Okay, guys. <laughs> so, here we go. So under strategy, I actually chose quality of life. Now that's because for me, shipping and packaging the paint, painting is the bane of my existence. It really is. I don't know what the bane of your existence is, but it's the bane of my existence. Now I feel like a lot of coaches would come in and say, well, Brittany, why don't you just like mix that part of your process if it's driving you crazy? Now, I know we all know our couples and clients best, right? 
For me, actually, a core element of my service is taking the painting home. Um, as you can imagine, that after hours and hours of partying and drinking, a lot of my people don't want to be responsible for their heirloom work of art. And understandably, a lot of the planners I work with don't want that liability on them as well, which I completely understand. So I always take it home, thus, this still has to remain a part of my process. But it's impacting my quality of life. So that's the category I chose. The second one is connection. I feel like I could do a really much better job of attending to that touch point of, we went through this incredible process before together, instead of it just like falling off a cliff, how can we connect in that way? And also I feel like right now I'm not doing a good enough job of uh, getting reviews because I'm kind of letting that beautiful process just kind of, you know, fade away. And then number three under style, I obviously chose off boarding. So for me, this is what my formula has been looking like. I scored myself a 2.5 under quality of life because the shipping and packaging is really just the bane of my existence. <coughs> I scored connection of three because it's not bad. It's just more creativity can definitely just be injected, right? And it's affecting how many reviews I'm capable of getting. And of course, the offboarding is a two. Not horrible, just anticlimactic. So that to me is a elementary school math. Is that a 7.5? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 7.5 out of 15 is a failing grade, right? If you know, if we were in third grade and you know, you got the paper, the test back, and you had to flip open to see the score that the teacher wrote on the back, it's bad. It's a 50. We're we're in F. So that's what I'm. You know, this is one of the things I'm really working on this year, and how the formula kind of helped target my brain and identify something that I can improve. But here's the really fun way to use the formula, and that's for ideation. Now, I'm going to give a personal example of how this formula and what it crafted for me has really helped me find success in my business. And it starts when I started. And I really knew that I wanted to establish myself as a destination live wedding painter. But like I talked about before, there was no one to look up to, right? Now we all know amazing photographers and planners especially who know how to put destination work at the front of their brand. But for us live painters, especially at the time, there was no one doing this. So I had no idea what the heck to do. So I really had to get personal and delve into what made me, Brittany, the person unique. So I went to strategy, looked at my categories, and was attracted to attraction. And I leaned into the fact that me as a person, I've always wanted to visit every US state and territory. I've always wanted to do that. I've always, I still want to visit every major league baseball stadium. I'm that kind of person. And I definitely still want to visit like all of our key national parks, right? That is something that's core to me, Brittany. So I was like, well, why can't I inject this into my business? What if I create a marketing campaign where I get to tell everyone, hey, I would love to live paint a wedding in every state. It kind of kills two birds with one stone. One is for one stone. One, it's great for business, and two, it fulfills something for me personally as Brittany. And the thing that's been so cool about this is something I didn't anticipate, which is people who will never be my client, whether um, you know I'm not their style, they got married already, whatever that is, they still share my goal because they're connected to the fact that they can still help me achieve it, even if transactionally they'll never be a client. And that's something I really didn't anticipate, that all of these amazing people, especially through social media and whatnot, would want to help Brittany, the person, achieve something that's important to her, even though we'll never exchange a dime. So that's been really cool to watch like come to fruition. Number B under my story category, I chose experience and building trust. Now, I apologize. Did I mention my husband's a pilot earlier? Yeah. He is the ace in my deck. And he has a breadth of knowledge and experience that until all of this, I didn't think I could lean, really lean into, right? But he has really come in handy. In particular, about three years ago, like in the heart of COVID, um, I was contacted by a mother of the bride who we got on the phone and she was just in tears 
because uh, her daughter was getting married in New Jersey. This was 2020 or 2021, and her wedding was a COVID casualty. Um, I'm not sure how it was down here, but especially for New York, New Jersey, um, the capacity levels for events, that wasn't lifted as fast as some other areas. And so she called me and said, you know, the, the, her big dream wedding is off. I'm desperately trying to put together a thing for like 20 people in the backyard of my beach house down the shore in New Jersey. And I really think the live painter would really cheer her up since everything else just completely fell apart. And I had to be honest with her and I said, you know, I see this party is on a Saturday. I booked for a wedding in Dallas the evening before that Friday. Now, I will not enter into a contract with you unless you understand that there are some things that could absolutely go wrong and I will not make it. She understood we came to an agreement that, God forbid, something went wrong. You know, we, I would pay from photos, still get them something. We worked it out. Something went wrong. Uh, I did my wedding in Dallas, and my husband and I realized our best option was to catch a 6 a.m. flight out of Houston to get me to New Jersey. So about 3, 4 a.m., somewhere between Dallas and Houston, we get the ping on our phones that our flight was canceled. And I was like, well, I am not from around here. I don't know what the heck to do. We pulled into a random Sheets gas station in the middle of God knows where and got to work. He went onto his pilot forums. He started talking with guys who were scheduled to work that morning. Uh, he went into a website that a lot of pilots use personally to see what the seating capacity is like on some planes, because if they need to stand by or something, he got to work. Lo and behold, within 20 minutes, we had a solution, found another plane, made it to New Jersey, and it all worked out. But that is a breadth of knowledge and experience that I can personally lean into that separates me and my brand from, let's say, a lot of other live artists who maybe don't have access to that. So you bet I lean into that when it comes into telling my story because it builds trust with my clients that you can trust me to bring me out to wherever you're getting married, I will get there. And I will get your painting there and back safe. And number three is style. Uh, you will notice in my work that a lot of my paintings are very venue, very space focused. Now that's lovely because naturally I kind of tend to gravitate towards that as an artist anyway. But even if I didn't, I know myself and I would know I would use that as a strategy to ensure that a couple who is hiring me and putting in the expense to bring me out to wherever they're getting married, they can rest assured that their painting is going to reflect the very reason why they chose that destination location anyway. Um, it just happened to work out for me that the two things just are natural. And so we're getting there. I've done 20 or 21 states, which doesn't seem like a lot, but as I was going through this, I realized the reason that I'm not closer to 50 yet is because I've been able to go back to so many states multiple times, especially something like Texas where that first couple that trusted me to come out there to check off, you know, their state off the list, that painting was shared. Other Texas couples saw me, loved me enough to fly me out there. That check states off my calendar. So it gets tricky trying to, you know, check new states off the list. But who cares? I get to work with really cool people, right? They love me, why not? And can we please just acknowledge, yes, my amazing husband took that picture of me in the blue sweater and there was a tree coming out of my head. <laughs> it's like, I swear, like nine whatever years later, the whole Instagram boyfriend thing, he just doesn't get it. I love him so much. If he's watching on the stream, I love you, man, but shh. <laughs> All right, quick second. Do you remember on this slide I said I was going to come back to this point? about how leading with style can leave you vulnerable to market changes and lost opportunities. And this is where I want to highlight a really wonderful colleague of mine up in DC. Is anyone familiar with Abby Jew photography? Totally okay. She is based in DC, which is really lucky for me. We, I've had the pleasure of working with her and being photographed by her. Um, I would honestly say she is nationally renowned now, if not internationally. And the thing about Abby is, when I entered the market, especially the DC market, Abby and her team were already very well established. When I thought of Abby, 
I immediately linked her with Martha Stewart weddings. The amount of times Abby and her team were featured in Martha Stewart is insane, including the wedding we got to work on together. But Abby's work, especially at the time, was that quintessential fine art, elevated, luxurious photography, highly editorial, not quite bright and airy, but you can envision it even just as I'm saying it, right? Now, I apologize, I didn't take into account that the projector was going to tweedledee with the, um, the coloring. So if you would love to, please take out your phones, if you would love to, otherwise don't worry about it, because I really wanted to highlight the differences in her past Instagram grid and her current Instagram grid. You don't have to, but it's a lot easier to see the true colors um, on the phone screen. Now, here are some screenshots I took of stage directions. On my, your left, my right, is her grid from a few years ago. So you can see exactly what I mean by Martha Stewart editorial, right? Her subjects are very centered. Um, and I, I apologize for the color. It is very like bright and airy edited. Everything is centered. The table settings are centered. The couple is centered. Uh, even if there's a little bit of authentic posing and movement, everything feels a little bit posed. And that's because Abby was really shooting for publication. And if you think about publication, if Martha's giving you a two page spread and a photographer only has four images to show off their wedding, each one of those images has to tell the story in that square grid, right? But look at her grid now on the left, which I took a screenshot of that a few days ago. Now, please trust me when I say that the coloring is much more true to life now. Some would even say it's moody. I, as an artist, would argue it's not moody. But I want to draw your attention to that bride in the top left square. Again, a little bit hard to tell, but have you all seen the trend that's really popular right now of, um, there's like a, I call it like a fine art Polaroid thing that's going on, where people are really leaning into the like 90s vignette nostalgic as if someone went around your wedding and snapped it with a Polaroid. It's, it's lovely, it's cool. Abby started doing that two to three years ago. But as you can see, even in just a 12 square grid, there's one example of it, right? Whereas now I'm seeing a lot of photographers do it. But here's the thing about what I'm pretty sure happened with Abby. I think she was testing out this like 90s camera flash um, style a few years ago. Couples started coming to her really attracted to it, but she listened to them. And she listened and said, you know, I think what I'm realizing is that couples aren't just attracted to the style of that kind of 90s nostalgia Polaroid. What they're really more attracted to is the authenticity that it provides. Because for as lovely as high editorial luxury wedding photography is, sometimes it looks just that, very editorial. All of these images are created to tell one story in one shot. Whereas you can now see with Abby, her each of those images clearly exist in a full gallery that's telling a story. There's an authenticity to the movement in comparison to her previous compositions. I mean, I flip in love that one in the middle where the groom is wiping a tear from his eye as his bride just gracefully moves over the shot. That's beautiful, and even here it's hard to tell, but these either bridesmaids or wedding guests, their gowns are still very vibrant. Even if you look at the original photo, the coloring is very much what I think I would see with my human eyes if I was standing right next to her, lens or not. In comparison to her previous work, that was clearly very edited, right? So I would argue, if, and I will ask for this, if I sat down with Abby to work on her formula, this is what I'm pretty sure happened. Under strategy, she leaned into attraction and buyer persona. She understood her already luxury clients were transitioning towards a fashion-focused, party-forward vibe and away from fine art editorial as we knew it. And under story, she leaned into their desires 
Oh, you're good. <laughs>